Judges chapter 16, beginning at verse number 4. Beginning at verse number 4. Judges 16. I'll be reading on the screen from the English Standard Version. If you have another one, read along silently. English, Judges 16, 4, starting at verse 4. Let me encourage you, even though I put it up on the screen, everybody ought to have their own Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. I believe in my heart. This ain't good what I'm about to say, but I believe in my heart this is going to happen. The way things are going right now in this world and in this country, there's going to come a time where you may not be able to have a Bible. People are banning stuff left and right. And there's been jokes and some comments about banning the Bible because it has hate in it, because it says God doesn't like this and God doesn't like that. And because it disagrees with the world, the world thinks we shouldn't have it. There's going to come a time you're going to need to have your own Bible whether it's a paper Bible or electronic, but you need to know the word of God in your heart. Amen? I think, I think I'm right about that. Beginning at verse number four, verses four and five. After this, he loved the woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his uh, great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. If you will, go to verses 18 and 19. Verses 18 and 19 of that same chapter. Verses 18 and 19 of the same chapter. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, he sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up against uh, again for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. Verse 19, and she made him sleep on her knees and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head and she began to torment him and his strength left him. Verses 28, verses 28, 29, and 30. Verses 28, 29, and 30. It says this, Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O God, that I may uh, be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and leaned his weight against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those who he had killed in his life. I want to talk to you from the topic, Samson's Fatal Attraction. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, this morning, pastor's going to talk about Samson's Fatal Attraction as you take your seats. Woo! Now this is a fatal attraction. This is a fatal attraction. If you've ever wondered about it, this here, this here, this here right here, this is a mess. This is a mess. In 1987, there was a movie that came out by the topic, Fatal Attraction. It was a romantic psycho thriller that starred Michael Douglas and Glenn Close, and it followed a married man's one night stand. It always starts off with a one night stand, but it never ends, it's just a one night stand. And, and, and his one night stand came back to haunt him because the scorned mistress, it ain't nothing like a woman scorned. I thought you said you were going to leave her. Well, I changed my mind. You what? I thought you said that it was just me. What? You stayed out and stayed with who? What? It's nothing like a woman scorned. And she began to stalk him for the rest of the movie. It was a fatal attraction, I tell you. It's more than just a thriller. 
It's a cautionary tale about the dangers of lust, betrayal, and the consequences of our actions. Don't you know that our actions have consequences? Touch somebody next to you and say, actions have consequences. Like those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we're not, if we're not careful, we'll end up in a similar circumstance. We'll end up in a fatal attraction. But we do on a regular basis, but ours are spiritual fatal attractions. We get involved and let Satan direct our path. We stop coming to church, stop reading our Bible, stop listening to the gospel, and everybody else and everything else is fair game. We'll listen to TikTok before we listen to Job and John and Mark and Matthew and Luke. You'll ask somebody, what you been listening to lately? They say, well, on TikTok, well, what have you read lately in the Bible? Well, you ain't read nothing. A spiritual fatal attraction. Why? We live in a world that's in opposition to the Spirit of God. Everything that God says is good, we don't want to get involved with. But what the world says is good, we run to. And it, it's usually a bunch of junk. There's shows on TV, How to Get Away with Murder. There's another show, Naked and Afraid. People running around on an island trying to figure out how to survive naked. But we'll run to it. Did you see the episode last night? I, you should have seen You got to tune in and you tell somebody else about it. When is the last time you told somebody about, about the book of Revelation? About what's going to happen in end times? When is the last time you told somebody about 1 Corinthians? About how we're supposed to live for God? The Israelites were enticed and drawn away, seduced. We all get seduced. Don't sit there and look sideways at me. I don't mean you necessarily fall into that, but we, at least the seduction comes. We get, and sometimes a seduction is quiet. You ever go to H-E-B and you're just pushing your card, you're going down aisle number three. You just look over some green beans and you make eye contact with somebody of the opposite sex and you realize she's looking at you and you go like, hey. You go over there and get those Del Monte green beans, trying to look sexy, trying to take it off the shelf. <laughs> trying to flex that one muscle you got left. And you sit there going like, hey! And as she goes by, there's a seduction all the time. We try to act like it's not there, but it's there. We're always getting seduced. Always, always. Aisle number three, green beans. Y'all gonna never go down aisle three and look at green beans the same no more. Y'all gonna be looking at it sideways. But the bottom line is that the same thing happens to us today that happened to Samson and Delilah. Uh, we, we, we sincerely want to walk and follow God. We always get up every morning and we say, my life's going to be different. I ain't going to do what I did before. I'm not going to live like I used to live. I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I know he's my Lord. I know he's my master. I know he died for me. I know he rose from the grave three days later with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. I know he did, and I'm living for him the rest of my life. But man, so this day, I'm not going to go to that Walmart. I'm going to go to H-E-B. It ain't no better over there. We have to be careful or we'll pull away if we're not on our guards. That's why the book of James chapter 1, 14 and 6, 15 says this. But we are tempted when we are drawn away and trapped by our own evil desires. Then evil desires conceive and give birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. For Samson illustrated to us a prime example of what happens when we allow ourselves to be tempted and pulled away. See, the big problem with Samson is this. He was a Jew, a man who grew up in Judaism, who knew the true and living God. He's coming after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He knows that God saved his people, brought them out of 400 years of captivity, brought them across the Red Sea, brought them through 40 years in the desert, and yet, with all that history, you act like you don't know nothing, like mom and dad ain't taught you nothing. We all get out there after we leave home, sometimes at home, but after we leave home and act like we ain't got no Bible sense, like God ain't never spoke to us, 
like we ain't never been in that Christmas play or it didn't mean nothing to us. And then we get out and we get seduced because I found something out. Listen, this is especially for the younger people. Satan, the devil, is real. And he does not come at you in a scary suit. He doesn't come at you like they do in the movies where he looks green or red or have horns or have a pitchfork and he lives down there with smoke and, and fire and brimstone and talks with a deep voice. Ah! <laughs> no, he don't come at you like that. He come at you in a way, excuse me, he comes at you in a way that's attractive. Listen, if he's trying to get to the sisters, he's going to come at you with a suave dude. And y'all going to be sitting there going like, oh, he got nice hair. Oh, my goodness. That's how he come to the brothers. He's going to come at you 20, you know, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola shape. 36, 24, 36. He's going to come at you in a sexy way that looks exciting, looks riveting, looks like I got a hat at. That's how Satan comes at us. So be on your guard because he's not coming the way you think he is. And then you find yourself, I didn't know how I got involved like this. And she said, she's six months now. We, I, I didn't know we were going to have a baby. What did you think was going to happen? <laughs> Samson and his own, he was the strongest man in the Bible ever, and the strongest man we know of. But he was weak morally. He had been laying, his whole life was laying the groundwork for this last chapter of his life. This is the last part of the story of Samson, y'all. This is the last part. It's a fatal attraction. It's a fatal attraction. That don't even sound right. That's like you go to the Six Flags Fiesta, Texas, and you ride the fatal attraction. I don't want to get on nothing that starts with fatal. I mean, rides are scary enough, but I want to make sure it ends and I get back off. When the story starts in chapter 13, he's 20 years old. He had been ruling God's people for 20 years now in chapter 16. So he's about 40 years old, but he's still a fool. You know, it's nothing like an old fool. You can't expect it to be a fool when you're young. But most of us still act foolish in our 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and 100s. Because you still got a mind, you still know. But Samson is the same old guy that he was 20 years ago. He never dealt with the heart issues. His heart was supposed to be with God, but his heart was wherever his eyes took him. In this final chapter, Samson, we find him on the hunt for a new sexual encounter. He's still looking for the Philistine women, and there's the big problem. Brothers, let me help you with something. If you're going to date, at least date a Christian woman because you're Christian. And the chances are, if y'all don't get married, you don't want to be married to somebody who, ch who chases after a fish god. A fish god? What? Uh, when you chase after the world and you marry the world, you get worldly ways. And then later on, when y'all grow up, one of y'all going to want to go to church, the other one's going to want to stay home. Or one's going to want to worship God, the other's going to mock you, laugh at you, be mad at you, try to stop you. Marriage is hard enough on a good day. Do I have a witness? Just say amen, everybody. So, so I, we will not know it's you. It, it, it's hard on a good day, but you surely don't want to throw in somebody who don't know Jesus. Because see, when you come to me for, for marital counseling, I give you the Bible. I'm going to give you God's word. And one of you who say will understand, the other one won't. Y'all got to be on the same page at least there. We got to at least start together. Let's start on even ground. Amen. God gives us. He says, don't be unequally yoked. Uh, uh, uh. So the story begins. This is the last chapter. This is how the crazy story ends. Chapter 16, verse 1. Verse 1. On the day that Samson went to the Philistine town called Gaza, we talk about Gaza today. Today in the news, today in the news, Gaza is being bombed. Israel and Hamas and the Philistines, and matter of fact, the nation that Israel is fighting today, that's the land that the Philistines established. 
Ah, yeah, I didn't know that. So he went to Gaza to spend the night with a prostitute. And the word spread around town that he was sleeping with her. And the idea was the guys of the town, they are hot. They are mad with Samson because of all the damage he's done to them and to their town. So they decided, we're going to wait until morning. And when he get up, we're going to grab him. Verse number three. Verse number three says, but Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Because Samson ain't dumb in that regard. He knew that they were waiting on him, so he says, this is what I'm going to do. They're waiting for me to get up in the morning. I'm going to get up tonight. But what he did is he went and grabbed the, the doors to the city. Now, when I say door, I don't mean a door like those doors. I mean these doors that are so heavy, it takes four men to open one side and another four men over here to open this other side. These are huge doors that guard the entire city. And when you open these doors, you can drive carts and cattle and all kind of stuff through them. Uh, in modern day times, we could probably drive trucks and cars through these gates. He grabs these gates, which we estimate to be about 700 pounds each. And he puts them on his shoulder. And he walks 40 miles and take them home in Israel. And the idea is, y'all tried to get me, didn't you? And the very gates that you use to protect you, I just stole. That's how bad y'all think y'all are. Y'all think y'all gonna come get me? It sounds like almost like a mafia thing, doesn't it? Y'all think y'all gonna come get me? Well, I got the gates. You know, so he takes the gates and takes them home. And he does this to scare them and to show them I'm more powerful than all of y'all put together. Because in a previous chapter, we see where he beat a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. So he takes them. So that's how the story starts. Now, the, this contrasts with what he just ended in chapter 15, where he called on the Lord. So far in chapter 16, he's not calling on God right now. He's in his arrogance, in his self entitlement, with his violent temper, with his misguided understanding of spiritual power. He didn't understand God gave him that spiritual power for God's glory. But he used it for his glory. Y'all, this is real today. We are gifted people. Those of us who come to Jesus Christ, we all got spiritual gifts. Most of us got two or three. I know one of my gifts is administration. One of my gifts is preaching. One of my gifts is pastoring. But when we get full of ourselves and we think we're doing it on our own, that's when you get these crazy pastors, crazy preachers, crazy leaders, who's saying all kind of stuff that's not in the text. And anything to make me look good and make y'all uh, applaud for me. Then you know I'm using it for the wrong purpose. Somebody say amen right there. If, it's, if, it, if it becomes about Russell, uh, that I'm misguided and I'm misusing my spiritual gifts. My job is not for you to look at me. I'm just the tool who God speaks through this morning. But my goal is to let my light so shine before men that they may see my good works and glorify him that's in heaven. Not glorify me because I will let you down. You might like me on Sunday and be mad at me on Monday. I'll let you down. I'll promote you on Wednesday and demote you on Thursday. I'll let you down. People need to understand it's about God. And don't you think that you're the only one that can sing. You're the only one that can usher. You're the only one that can work with the youth. You're the only one that can lead the men's ministry or the women's ministry. You're the only one that can fix anything around here. No! Die and see what happens. Die and see what happens. We're going to say, we're going to bring your body up here. We're going to say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We're going to cry. We're going to eat some chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. We're going to roll you out of here. We're going to bring somebody else in your spot, and we're going to go on with church. Hallelujah. One monkey don't stop the show. God is not happy with the way he's living. And because of the text, y'all say, well, God allowed it to happen, so it must be good. No, God allows you to keep living, and it don't make it means that you're good. 
We get away with a lot of stuff and God don't take us out. If God really didn't have mercy, he would have taken me out at like two years old. When mama said, don't do da 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 and I did it anyway, it was a little two-year-old boy just walking down the hall going, uh. Oh. And then Irene and Sylvania said, well, we're going to have to make another one. Ah! Today, Samson's story involves the third and final Philistine woman. He keeps messing with these Philistine women. He needs to go back home and talk to a good Jewish girl. And, and in today's case, he needs to go somewhere and find a good Christian woman. That's how I found my wife. The story does not teach us about genuine love and romance, but it teaches us about the dangers of being too close to a sinner who don't care about your God. There may be pleasures for a season, but the end of sin is never worth the pleasure it provides. So I got three things to help you remember this sermon today. The first point I want you to understand is this. Number one, their story of love. Their story of love. Don't get it twisted. Watch this. Samson loved a woman. We're told that he loved her, and, 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 and this is the third woman that we record. The first woman was the woman of Timnah in Judges 14. The, the next one was the prostitute of Gaza at, at the top of chapter 16 that we just talked about. Now here's Delilah. And there may have been others, but these are the only ones that are mentioned in the Bible. All three of them were Philistine women. They were not trying to get with him to know about Jehovah God. They just wanted to be with him. And he didn't get that. He was kind of slow. He was attracted to women who should have been off limits. There's an old country and western song. I can't remember who wrote it, but it talked about she's a little bit angel and she's a little bit devil. In other words, he wants a woman who's a little bad, a little good. You know, a little bad in this area, a little good in this area. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because you're going to get too much of the one or the other, and it's going to make you mad. The, true, the same thing is true for us today. The Lord gave us our sexual desires, and they're good. It's nothing wrong with it. It's part of how God made us. But it's not the sexual desires. It's how you exercise it. It's where you use it, where you put it. It's, it's to be done within the framework of marriage. So when we step outside of the boundaries of marriage and engage in any sexual expression, it crosses the line into sin. He didn't call us to get with somebody else. He didn't call us to have homosexual relationships. He didn't call us to get with somebody uh, 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 who's not our spouse. He, God wants his people to be sexually pure. Look at what it says right here in, in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, do not be unequally bound together with unbelievers. Do not make mismatched alliances with them inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship can light have with dark? What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial or Satan? And what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. God says the two don't go together. One is light and one is dark. Samson was made to be light to the Gentiles, to share the gospel with them, not to sleep with them. In this text, we are told that Samson loved Delilah, and she touched his heart, and it, it appeared that he really did care for her. And verse 17 says he trusted her with his most valuable secrets. Listen, when you start getting that close to a woman, Fellas, we've all been caught in that, duh. <laughs> and we don't like to tell nobody about it. And you got to call, and the only, really, only person who really knows is usually a close buddy of yours. I remember a friend of mine, he and I roommate, were roommates together. We rented an apartment together. And I tried to tell him, I said, dude, Man, I, I, I've been watching this for a minute, man. I didn't know how to say this because I don't want to ruin our relationship. But I said, man, she using you. And he says, I know, Russ. 
but I like it. I love it so much. I said, oh, okay, no, as long as you know. <laughs> but that reminds me, that reminds me about this song by Percy Sledge in 1966. He wrote this song called When a Man Loves a Woman. Yeah. Listen to the words. You don't know nothing about this. It says this. It says this. When a man loves a woman, can't keep his mind on nothing else. He trades the world for the good thing he's found. If she's bad, he can't see it. She can do no wrong. And he'll turn his back on his best friend if he puts her down. When a man loves a woman, he'll spend his very last dime trying to hold on to what he needs. He'd give up all of his comforts and sleep out in the rain if she says that's how it ought to be. That's one of them, duh. <laughs> Fat, dumb, and happy. The fact that Samson loved Delilah does not excuse his sin, though. His sin comes in two parts, his fornication and loving the world too closely. You're too close to the world, dude. You're too close to the world. You're loving the Philistines who we're supposed to be destroying. But Delilah loved too. But her love was different. Delilah loved wealth. Delilah loved money. She didn't like Samson like that. He was messed up. He thought she loved him too. Scripture makes it plain. The rulers of the Philistines came to Delilah with 1,100 pieces of silver each. And there were five guys. Five men had it. They had it. They had it. How would you feel if you come home or you wake up and the front half of your house is gone because Samson took it with him to his town? If somebody just, not your front door, I mean your whole front of your house is just gone. Honey, I think somebody been here. And the house is just, the front of your house is just gone. They're mad because he took the doors that protects them at night. These 700 pound doors, he threw them on his shoulders, walked 40 miles and took them home. The guys are saying in so many words, he gotta go. So they put a hit out on Samson. But one of the first ways you put a hit on somebody is you mess with their girl. You always see this in gangster movies. You threaten them. Well, you know, it sure would be hard and bad if you, your girl don't make it home tonight. Wait a minute, you leave her alone. I'm just saying, you know, it would be bad if uh, she didn't make it. So they go to her, and they offer her 1,100 pieces of silver each. And they say, we want you to do something for us, Delilah. And it was easy for her because she didn't like him anyhow. She was using him. Uh, 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 they said, we want you to entice him. Everybody say entice. Now, entice is a word with the idea of we want you to act like an innocent person so you can deceive somebody. That's what entice really means. And we want you to extract from, from, from Samson his secret to his strength. Delilah's willing to go along with it. She said, okay, 1,100 each, that's a good deal. In today's money, what they were offering her then, back then, comes out to about $750,000 today. They were offering her three quarters of a million dollars to do away with this guy. So she said, well, let me think about it. Okay. It gave her about two seconds. The relationship was a transactional relationship. He's doing it for love. She's doing it for money. He's doing it to get her in the sack. She's doing it to, get to sack him. We got to be weary of traps laid by modern day Delilah's by the devil that will enable us to escape the devil's traps, we gotta get closer to God. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says it like this. In case you think you're in a situation and you say, it just don't seem no way out. I just can't figure out how I'm gonna make it. I don't think how, I, I, I mean, I've been struggling. I've been working through tough times. God, help me out. God says this to encourage you today. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. Somebody say faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow you and the temptations 
to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Somebody ought to shout right there. He's already, this is not Pastor House, and this is the word of God. He says, but you got to call on me. You ain't going to get out of it on your own. Now, you got in it on your own, but now you need me to get you out. If you're going to call on me to get you out, this is how we're going to do it. Call on me. Luke says it. Luke chapter 22 says it like this. Now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He's warning them. He says, Simon, Simon. But he's talking to all the disciples. He says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, I need you to help me with the rest of this sermon. Just like he said, Simon, Simon, put your name in there. Ready? One, two, three. Now, everybody ain't talking. I need your name in there. So you got to yell out your name twice. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah, there you go. Because see, if you don't say your name, you think that this ain't about you. You think that God is talking about everybody else in the, in the sanctuary except you. All them need Jesus. I know I've seen them. They all need Jesus. No, you need Jesus. And, I, and, and, and we all need him for salvation, but there's another kind of salvation. That means to rescue us from our daily trials and difficulties. Amen? So he would, he would read like this, Russell, Russell. Satan has asked, asked to, to sift you like wheat. In other words, uh, let, me, let me at him. Just turn me loose on Russell, and I get him. But this is how much God loves you. He says this. But I, being Jesus Christ, when I was alive on earth, he says, but I prayed for you. Aren't you glad that Jesus prayed for you? Even before you were born, Jesus prayed for you. I pray for you, Russell, that your faith won't fail. And when you have turned, ah. Ah. And when you've turned back, the idea is, I know you're going to fail, Russ, because you're human. I know, I already know the end of your story, Russ. I know the, the end from the beginning. I already know you're going to fail. But when you do turn back, turn, share your story and strengthen those around you. Somebody ought to hear me right now. Ah, oh, we're all up here by God's grace and his mercy. So this is the story of love. Samson loved a woman, but the woman loved wealth. But there's also, there's also is a story of lies. It's a story of lies. Neither Samson or Delilah were honest in their relationship with each other. Both of them were lying. They are both were lying. The only way a relationship can thrive is to be honest and true to each other and to love each other and to forgive each other and to move forward with each other. Amen? Amen. Samson's lies were senseless. His lies were, I don't know any lies that do make sense, though. It just don't make no sense. If you're lying, it's a lie. But his lies were senseless. When Delilah began to ask Samson about the source of his strength, he plays with her. He's teasing her. He's taunting her because Samson thinks he's smarter than her. Brothers, I've tried those games over the years. Be careful. The sisters are real sharp. The sisters are real sharp. They're smarter than us. Uh, don't tell them I said it. Uh, keep, keep, keep track. Here's the first lie. The first lie is in verse 7 through 10. He says to her, because she's asking him, Samson. Now remember, she's being paid. She's being paid to get the answers. She wants the money. Samson. How do you get so strong and how do you stay so strong? Tell me your secret. So he says, bind me or tie me up with seven fresh Bowstrings. Now, a bowstring is really animal intestines. And take the animal, and, and, and don't, 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 don't freak over this, but did you know that cellos and violins and those kind of instruments, they were often strung together with animal intestines. Those were some of the first bowstrings that we used to make those instruments. 
And so when they were playing music, they were playing on animal intestines. But the bowstring is also the bowstring on an arrow, a bow and arrow. So he said, it's real strong stuff when it dries out. So he said, use that. And she did, and she says, Samson, the Philistines are coming. And he jumps up, and, and he breaks them with no effort at all. She realized he lied to her. Lie number two in, in verses 12, uh, 11, 12, and 13. Samson, you lied to me. How can I know the strength? If you, you say you love me, what's the strength? What's the secret of your strength? He said, okay, here it is. Tie me up with new rope, new green rope, because it's so strong, no man can break that. So she tied him up. I don't know what they were into, but she tied him up, and he breaks them like a man would break a piece of thread. Lie number three, verses 13b and a. Samson, you keep lying to me. I, 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 you say you love me, Samson. What's the secret to your strength? I thought you were going to tell me. You said you were going to tell me. You didn't tell me. He said, okay, here it is. Take seven locks, the, the seven locks of my hair, and weave them into the loom that you use to make cloth. When you take, when a woman or a man is weaving cloth, you take the thread and, and you weave it through a loom and it makes the cloth that you use to cut to make the clothes. So he's telling her, now take my hair and weave it into that loom that you already got going right there. We assume that she had one in the room. And she weaves his seven locks of hair into this, this gadget, this machine, this thing. And then she says, Samson, the, the Philistines are coming. And he jumps up and when he does, the whole thing just comes with him. And he's just dragging this thing on with his hair. And she said, Samson, you lied again. You lied again, Samson. Uh, 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 you, you told me that that would work. Note this. Most people think they can control their sin. And, and the truth is, he is so full of himself and playing with her. He said, I got this, this whole thing under control. She'll never fight. I'm just messing with her because I can control this. He's leaving God out. It's all about him. Romans 6, 11 through 14 says this. So you should consider yourself dead to the power of sin and alive to, the, to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live and do not give in to the sinful desires. The idea of putting this scripture here at this time is to say, you trying to live on your own strength, Samson. You forgot that in the last chapter you had to call on God when you were thirsty. And God put that thirst in you to let you be reminded that you need him. So now we have a new life. We need Christ. His, his lies were senseless, but Delilah's lies were sinister. Her lies were sinister. They were evil. It's like, ah, ha, 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 that evil witch. Ah! While Samson was toying with her, she was playing him like a toy. She said, if, she, now this is the one she put, the guys, y'all know about this one. She played the, if you love me, you would, da, 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 da. Now she throws that one at him. Ah, oh, girl, you know I love you. Yeah, but if you love me, you would tell me. And they said that she persisted day after day, begging and pleading and asking, give me the answer. If you love me, you said you love me. Ah! Oh. He's playing with fire. God gave him a gift to destroy the Philistine, but he's letting her wear him down. He's letting the Philistine woman wear him down the, the question is asked in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27. Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? In other words, can the sin of adultery be pulled in close to you and you don't have any effects from it? They're trying to say, stay away from what she's dealing with. The answer is no. If you play with sin, you're going to always get burned. Maybe not early, but eventually you're going to get burned. Listen, y'all, whatever you're going through in your life, Satan does not stop until he's ruined your life. Satan does not stop until he has backed you in every corner and to, to take all the values that you have in your life. Delilah loved the lies, and Satan is, is destructive. This is a fatal attraction. Their story of love. Their story of lies, and lastly, 
their story of loss. There's a loss that's about to come. In verses 17 through 20, Delilah wore Samson down. And he finally breaks, guys. He finally breaks. All right! It's like one of those James Bond movies. You know, they, have, they always have this evil James Bond guy who's going to take over the world. Ah! <laughs> and he's up in some mountain somewhere, or he's under the ocean somewhere. And he always has this evil woman running around with him. He's the evil dude. And I don't know how these evil guys get these beautiful women in James Bond. But these old, bald, fat, old guys, old, evil, carrying it, running around with a cat, but the woman next to him is beautiful, gorgeous. And there she is. And so she's there to wear down James Bond. But Delilah wore Samson down, and he told her the truth. He told her about his long hair is a symbol of my vow to God. It's a Nazarite vow. I'm not supposed to drink anything that comes from the grapevine. No grape juice, no grape wine. I'm not supposed to touch a dead body, an animal or human. And I'm not supposed to cut my hair, ever. Ah, so he finally tells her. And she says, oh, really? So now everything she does for the rest of the story is to afflict him. Both of them lose something. Delilah's losses were considerable. Samson was lured because of the lust of the flesh. But Delilah was lured because of the lust of the money. Delilah was a sinner before this event, and she remained one after the event. The real tragedy is that Samson was supposed to be the man of God, sent by God, purposed by God, equipped by God to go to the Jews, to be a, uh, from the Jews, to be a light to the Gentiles. Listen, before you come down on him, that's us in this room. Those who are streaming us live on Facebook right now. We are supposed to be a light to the world. But instead, we blend in with the world. And we say stuff like, well, I'll just live a good life in front of everybody. And that's going to be my witness. That's not what God told you to do. God said, yes, live a good life. Then he says, be ready always to talk about me. He says this. He says, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. So you don't have an option to stay quiet and say, well, I didn't want to witness. And then you say, well, the reason I don't tell people about my Jesus is because I don't know enough about the Bible like Pastor Houghton. I don't know enough about the Bible. The power comes through the Holy Spirit. He takes what you do say. Tell them that God loves them. Tell them that there's redemption. Tell them there's a way out. Tell them that God forgives sin. Tell them that God loves them just as they are, but he loves them too much to leave them the way they are. Tell them that God has a heaven to take them to so they don't end up in hell. Tell them something, but you don't have the option to walk away and not say anything. You, church, are a light to the world. I thought pastors were supposed to, no, 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 no. Don't get it twisted. I mean, you ain't been in church. The Bible says that the pastors and the preachers are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You ain't going to kill me. I can't sweep the church, cut the grass, change the light bulbs, and go out and witness too. Somebody got to do it. And I can't be at your job where you can be. I'm equipping you right now. That the question is, are you going to take this sermon and live it in front of some unsaved people and then tell them how they can be loved by God too? Or are you going to go back to your quiet ways? Well, I'm just going to go back to my cubicle because I don't want them to think I'm one of them holy rollers. You are a holy roller. I don't want them to think that I'm holier than thou. In other words, holier than thou means I'm holier than you. I am holier than you. That's the world's way of telling you to shut up and don't say nothing else. They try to embarrass you into quietness. You can't be embarrassed into quietness. Listen, time is too short. And hell is too long. You better tell your family. You better tell your friends. You better tell your neighbor. You better tell somebody that God loves them. And he has a place for them in glory. He says, I go away to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. But I got a place for you. Yeah. People need to know there's hope. If I hear about one more story.
suicide or suicide murder. I heard a story just the other day, last week, where a mother killed her child and then killed herself. That's a woman who didn't have any hope. That might have been a woman you crossed paths with, but you didn't say nothing to her. I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip. Yes, I am. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. There was a loss. Hers was considerable. She, 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 she was a sinner before this event, and she still she's died, she died a sinner. The real tragedy is, instead of trying to win her to Christ, he tried to win her to the bed. But because he allowed his passions to govern his life, he destroyed his testimony. Y'all, we destroy our testimony when we get out of character. When we lose our anger, when we cuss, when we overdrink, when we use drugs, when we fight with people, when we get mad at people, when we tell people off, when we give people a piece of our mind, everybody's watching. And then later on, the next day, when you come and say, y'all come over to our church. What? Don't call Skybridge by name when you invite them to church. Y'all mentioned them some other church somewhere else. Don't tell them you go to Skybridge because you didn't act in Christian. You're not acting like you believe in Jesus Christ. Delilah instantly, I hear you, Mom. Delilah instantly became a wealthy woman. She was financially set for the rest of her life, $750,000. But eventually, Delilah dies. And eventually, she's got to reckon her life with God. And eventually, she goes to hell because she never met Jesus Christ or she never met the God of, of the Hebrews. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37 says, For what shall it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? you rather have $750,000 or you want eternal security. No, you're going to be with God in glory for the rest of eternity. Which will it be? Delilah's loss was considerable, but Samson's loss was complete. Samson lost everything of value to him. He lost so much physically. He lost his vision. When they finally cut his hair, he lost his strength. But he didn't know he had lost his strength. So he got up off the bed with his hair gone, and he's clean shaven now on his head. And he decided, I'm going to get him like I've always done. And he goes after them, and they grab him and tie him and beat him down. And he had never been so humbled in his life because nobody has ever beat him, ever, ever. And he don't know what to do with that weakness now. And so they said what they did is, the first thing they did is they gouged out his eyes. A man without eyes, you can't see. And now you can control him. A man without eyes, he can't take care of himself, walk to a certain place without somebody guiding him, bathe himself, clean himself. He can feel around for parts and stuff, but he don't know where everything is. Now they can control him. They gouged out his eyes. Secondly, he lost his freedom. He lost his sight. He lost his freedom because they bound him. They put shackles on him. You only go when we say go. They bound him, and he lost his dignity. He lost his dignity for the first time. Samson went to Gaza. He went down there looking for a woman, for pleasure, for time to kick it, to party. He partied with his groomsmen at his wedding. This time, he returns as a prisoner of the Philistines. They take him, and they tie him to a grinder. And a grinder is one of those old mill things where you have this huge wheel made out of stone and you push it around. And as the wheel turns, you grind the grain, the wheat, the corn, everything else. And it was considered work for a woman or the lowest slave. So you gone from being God's dude with all this power, taking off doors to a city, 700 pounds each and marching them down to your town and you think it scared them it embarrassed them it did but now they got you because they found out your secret and they're using it against you y'all they humiliated him the mighty judge of Israel 
is now being forced to do slave labor. In Samson, we, the, we see the personification of the entire nation of Israel. They were just like him. They were bold on their own accord, but they didn't give God any glory. Like him, Israel was always inclined to chase after strange love. Like Samson, Israel was weak when, it got, when they forgot to dedicate themselves to God. Like Samson, Israel was blinded. Like Samson, Israel was bound. Like Samson, Israel was reduced to slavery. Like Samson, we, the church today, can be blinded. Like Samson, we today can be bound. Like Samson, the church of today can be reduced to slavery. When we forsake God and we hang out with the enemy. We hang out with the enemy every day. Most people who seem to call themselves believers, we don't know who the real believers are not. But you can tell by the fruit that they bear. So if you work with people who tell you they go to church or they love Jesus or they, go, they love God, and you say, well, what church do you go to? And they say, uh, uh, I know it. Don't, uh, can't think of the name of it. But it's over there off of a, uh, uh, okay, well, you know, it's just uh, what's your pastor's name? Oh, that, that's a, you know, oh, man, he comes on the radio. Uh, uh, Reverend, uh, I know how, uh, gosh, oh, we were just there last year. Uh, uh, um, uh, what's the last thing he preached? Oh, it was out of the Bible. Uh, 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 Matt, oh, you don't know Jesus. You don't know God. You're not involved in the life of the church. You hang out with Christians. You go to the building but you're not walking the walk. You're not talking the talk. It's easy to call yourself a believer. It makes you feel better, but you're not living better. You're not acting better. You're not letting God direct your life. It's easy to say, I, I know God. Does God know you? <laughs> Jesus said on that day, you're going to say, for, uh, uh, you're going to call my name, Lord, Lord, on that day of judgment. Lord, Lord. He says, I'm going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. Because you call me Lord, but you never let me be Lord over you. Be careful, church. We hang out around the world all the time, and you're supposed to be a light. I'm supposed to be a light to the world to tell them about God so they can go to heaven. Somebody told you. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're saved. Ah, ah, not only did he lose his physical strength, but he lost more spiritually. Let me say this. Listen, y'all. Y'all know this is true. Hair is something that's important to us. And, and we spend millions of dollars on hair and hair products. Somebody say amen. amen. Every year. We, we get so involved in hair cuts, hair coloring, hair perms, hair weaves, hair crochets, hair conditioners, hair washing, hair press. Do y'all still press? Hair braided, hair twisted, hair styled, hair gel, hair spritz, hair mail. It, we, we buy hair, twist hair, share hair, put on hair, take off hair. We like our hair. Well, if you think hair is that important, can you imagine this dude's hair? His hair gave him the power. Not really. His hair didn't really give him the power. His connection to God gave him the power, but his hair was a symbol of it. Ah, his, his spiritual life had been changed because he gave up his connection to God. His hair was an external symbol of his commitment to God. When Samson elevated Delilah in his heart, he demoted God in his heart. You can't have two gods. Either God's going to be God or he ain't. Ah. I told people a long time ago, and I'll say it again. I love my wife dearly. I love my sons. I love my mom, my family. But I put God over all of them because God is the one that made them and gave them to me. And God is the one that keeps them. 
and holds them and provides for them. And if I'm off the scene, I know God is still on the scene. Amen? Amen. He lost his fellowship with God, spiritually speaking. That's the most expensive haircut you could ever get. He lost his haircut with God. God had departed from him because he had let them cut his hair by giving them the secret. Then Samson allowed his hair to be cut. He, he crossed the final line between himself and God, and God took away his power. So he had no power. He lost his spiritual discernment. You know what discernment is? Discernment is our ability to tell right from wrong, good from bad. Discernment. But God had done something that miraculous that happened 1,100 years before him. He sent Jesus Christ. Uh, 1,100 years after him. He sent Jesus Christ. God the Son showed us how to live in complete obedience and trust in the Father. God the Son died for our sins and for those consequences and our mistrust and our foolish decision. Jesus, the Son of God, rose from the grave and ascended back into heaven and sent his Spirit into each one of us. The Spirit in those days came and went. Came and went, but the Spirit today he comes and he lives inside of us. He dwells inside of us. He gives us strength against temptation. And he restores us to repentance when we mess up. Somebody ought to shout amen. He lost his fellowship with God. But lastly, he lost his life. He lost his life. Look at the end of the story. Samson was the laughing stock of the Philistines in verses 23 through 25. The Philistines celebrated his imprisonment by assembling together to worship their god, Dagon, the fish god. And they elevated the fish god over the god of Israel, which is Jehovah God. Samson evidently repented, and this is why we believe he did. And God gave him one more opportunity. Because if you look carefully at verse number 22, it says this. After they cut his hair, verse 22 says this. But the hair on his head began to grow again. Remember, the hair was God's symbol to Samson that I'm with you. The hair on his head was a symbol that I'm giving you power. The hair on his head says that you and I have a relationship, Samson. The hair on his head says that as long as you got the hair, I give you the strength. The hair was being grown right after they cut it, God was already answering his prayer. Before they gouged out his eyes, God was already growing his hair. Before they bound him, God was already growing his hair. Before they had him grinding wheat, God was already growing his hair. God was already reestablishing the relationship. Don't you know that you and I messed up our relationship with God a long time ago? Aren't you glad that God started working on our relationship when we were still acting a fool? Somebody ought to shout right there. He didn't wait till he said, I'm sorry. God initiates reconciliation. Aren't you glad about it? Lastly, verse 27. He calls on God one more time. Samson asked somebody to help him over to the pillars that held up these columns. If you can remember these Greek buildings in Athens and places like that in Greece and, and Italy, and they have these huge stone pillars that you can't put your arm around. And he says, just get me over to the pillars, the two pillars that hold the house up. And on top of the house were 3,000 Gentiles, 3,000 Philistines, that had been jeering him and mocking him and laughing at him. And he's blinded. So he has one of the servants. He's just lead me over to them. So they said, they're going to chain him. And, and they use him as a, 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 a exposition. They're laughing at him. And look at him now. And can you imagine the things they were saying to him? So he tells the servant, just put my hand next to the pillar on one side. And he does. And he, he says, now put my hand on the pillar on the other side. 
And Samson is standing there. And the scripture says, and he bowed his head in humiliation to God. And with all his strength, he pushed the pillars till the house started tilting and it crumbled and it crushed and it killed Samson. But it killed all 3,000 people that was being held up by the pillars itself. Fatal attraction. It ended up fatally. He lost his life for the crazy that he did all his life. But in the end, God got the glory. God got the victory. Now you sit there and go like, that sounds kind of evil. That kind of kind of twisted. How did God get glory out of that? Remember, the whole reason he sent him in the first place was to just either be a light to the Gentiles and get the people out of the Gentile captivity and, if necessary, destroy the Gentiles, the Philistines, who were the enemy of God's people. And so he came at it in a long way, in the wrong way. And everything God told him to do, he did it in a twisted way. So God used even his twisted thinking to accomplish his, path, his purpose. What do we learn out of this? This is the conclusion. Everything that seems good to us ain't necessarily good for us. Secondly, let us not see Samson as a life to be emulated or a life with a license to sin. But let us teach us that God's patience and God's love for us exceeds our crazy, even in a fatal attraction. Somebody give God praise in the house.